First, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here again to report back on where we are on a number of US-related uh, files that we have been discussing this fall and, and summer. As uh, uh, Kinga, Madam Chair, said, we have this morning adopted a, a series of package on EU-US flows, and it includes a communication on how EU and US can together move forward in rebuilding trust, based on a report on the findings of the ad hoc working group, uh, and it also includes reports related to TFTP, TFTS, and US PNR. So I will focus on these things, but mentioning that there is also a report on the functioning of the Safe Harbor Agreement, but that I think will be re reported to you by Vice President Redding, who will come at a later stage. So, so uh, I'll leave that to her, if you don't mind. First, we have a report on the value of the TFTP data. This is something we agreed upon long before this discussion uh, and Snowden and NSA started. And we have prepared this evaluation uh, as stated in the agreement three years after the entry into force. It is not a review of the implementation. It is aimed to assess the value of TFTP data, including data retained for multiple years, and to assess the benefits that the agreement brings in um, countering terrorist investigations in the US and in the EU. And the report, which is available to you, describes many different ways in which uh, the TFTP data may be used in practice, and these explanations are accompanied by quite a lot of real cases. The uh, Commission and the US Treasury have worked hard for almost a year to identify numerous concrete examples where TFTP leads and information helped counterterrorism information and investigation on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, we have class had classified meetings with member states and Europol. Europol has contributed to the report and Treasury has analyzed over 1,000 TFTP reports and interviewed many of the counterterrorism investigators. Despite uh, the difficulties and the enormous uh, material here, we have uh, a large variety of examples presented in the report that you can see and study more closely after this meeting. You will find some very recent cases of the use of TFTP to investigate EU-based terrorist training uh, in Syria, and it also shows uh, other examples. It clearly shows the importance of TFTP data. Uh, it enables identification, tracking of terrorists and their support networks across the world. And it helps to detect financial structures of the organizations and new streams of support. It has been useful in both uh, bringing new evidence and also confirming information obtained from other sources. From the assessment of the age of TFTP data used in the investigation, it is also obvious that historical data do play an important role and they are valuable in counterterrorism reports. When we agreed on the EU-US TFTP, uh, the Commission was asked to submit a framework for extraction of data on EU soil and later to present a report on development of an EU system equivalent to the TFTP. This communication that you have in front of you today is the result of long and thorough assessment processes of all possibilities for an EU system which could satisfy the request of the Parliament and the Council. In order to gather all the information, we have done an external study and involved different experts from Europol, European Data Protection Supervisors, TFTP, designated provider, and many member states experts. We outlined different possibilities and options in view to trigger a discussion. We did that already in 2011, and I presented the results at that time. But we did not get any clear indications from you on where you wanted uh, to go. Some member states uh, said that maybe uh, extraction of data on the EU could be an option. So we, we took that um, also in our assessment, but we did not have a, a long discussion in the Council either. We have looked at the different options according to the principles in the information management strategy, necessity, proportionality, impact of fundamental rights, and cost effectiveness of each option. The option of retention and extraction regime was highlighted by some of you. Uh, and it would be a way to implement the framework for extraction on EU territory. In this option, the searches run under the TFTP would be relocated to the EU. <coughs> but this would not bring additional intelligence benefits for the EU as compared to the present situation. 
and it will not guarantee better data protection per se either. Uh, protection of access to data is, is key, of course, and therefore we would have to, to build in robust data protection uh, safeguard in, in any case here. It would not be possible to run searches directly on this data because of the existing security measure put in place by the designated provider. So a separate database would have to be created for this purpose. And that would involve important costs and resources uh, and also uh, quite a lot of efforts to, to ensure full compliance with data protection safeguards. So all in all, this option did not appear to be necessary, nor proportional, cost-effective, or bring the necessary um, data protection. And, of course, we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to set up another database in Europe right now? With regard to an EU independent system, we have looked at different uh, possibilities, also uh, to enlarge the scope of the system, including different payment methods and designated providers, because this is clearly, if one should establish such a system, that would be, be something that many member states would want, even if the, the willingness to any system is very limited in the Council. That could potentially enlarge our possibilities to fight terrorism and find the financing, but it would create a very complex organizationally and technically demanding system at very high costs, and one would also have to ask oneself whether this is proportionate. We also excluded uh, two unrealistic options, a fully centralized system operated exclusively at the EU level and a fully decentralized system run by authorities of the member states. So the only possible solution could be a hybrid option with certain functions of the EU system entrusted to the EU and other functions to the member states' authorities. And we reason a little bit about that in, in the report. Uh, it's, uh, it appears that it could equip then the EU with an independent investigation tool but might not be necessary in light of the existing arrangement and the TFTP providing access to EU and the member states. It would be expensive, it would be quite resource demanding, and it would take time to put in place and to maintain. And again, it would require the setting up of a totally new database. So therefore, the Commission does not intend to present any of these proposals, but we leave it to the Parliament and to the Council to discuss and to, to come up with, with the suggestions uh, possibly for the next uh, legislature. Also, I know I'm a bit long, Chairwoman, no, but okay. there are lots of it's reports, uh, so, so I, I want to be as clear as possible. And we also agreed that we would have a joint review carried out on the US-EU uh, PNR agreement, uh, and this was carried out this summer. We have had experts uh, to check if the Department of Homeland Security is operating in compliance with the standards and agreements in our agreement. And we have found that the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, do operate in line with the condition sets out. They are filtering data for flights which have no US <coughs> nexus. They have never accessed sensitive data for operational purposes and sharing is carried out on a case-by-case -case basis. It is logged and it takes place on the basis of written understandings and it has been very strict only on two cases. There are of course still room for improvement in further um, development of, of the agreement. Uh, we could do more when it comes to deleting and depersonalizing the data from the first day it is loaded in the system um, Today it happens that, that it uh, occurs a couple of days later when the system is updated. We are also advancing in the use of the, using of the, the um, push uh, and pull method. We keep records here. We have a best, better assessment. The use of pull is clearly decreasing. This year so far only 0.13% of all PNR data have been received with the pull method and as you know we are moving towards a full push system for next uh, summer. We are also discussing how we can improve the reciprocity and uh, further the police cooperation laid down in the agreement and more transparency mechanism for the redress uh, mechanisms. Um, the report also mentions that DHS implement measures that go beyond the agreement requirements. They foresee notification of the European Commission within 48 hours of access to sensitive PNR. 
They have installed a new procedure to quarterly oversee and review all travel targeting scenarios, analysis and rules to ensure that they are proportionate uh, and that the, it avoids discrimination. And uh, it also recommends, as I said, to, to speed up the work towards the push uh, method for next summer. Finally, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the um, discussions on TFTP and your call for suspension of the agreement. In reaction to those media allegations that we all have read about the US accessing data of the designated provider in the EU contrary to the agreement, I immediately took the decision to open formal consultation according to Article 19 in the agreement. And we have had a number uh, a great amount of contacts over the phone, uh, but I have also met and consulted f uh, personally with Sec Under Secretary David Cohen in Brussels and in Washington as late as last week. I have also been to the White House and met the security advisor of the President. Both uh, Secretary, Under Secretary Cohen and the White House have, have provided me with written assurances that the U.S government has not, since the entry into force of the agreement, breached it and accessed the data of the designated provider. And I have sent those letters to you as well, for your, your, so you can read it yourself. We have talked through all the elements. I have not received any evidence that it has been breached. It has not really revealed anything that they are uh, breaching the agreement. We have also been in close contact with the designated provider, SWIFT, and they have also made their own. Um, investigations on this and they also confirm that they have no signs that the agreement have been breached. We will of course uh, have a close look uh, at this uh, in the future as well and uh, next spring already we will do a, a review again. But with this in mind I have decided to close the consultations and I have informed the US about this yesterday night in a letter that I also have shared with you. You have also seen in this letter possibly that we have agreed on a uh, on a number of confidence building measures because the, there is a lack of trust between the US uh, and, and Europe. And we have agreed uh, to, to increase the transparency and to increase the role and the, the involvement of the overseers in the whole program. You can see that in the letter. As many of you and citizens all over Europe, I was and, and I'm still shaken about the revelations that Snowden have made and how NSA have been collecting data in a totally unproportioned way. This is clearly something that, that we, we are, have, have the right and are still upset about and there, there needs to be a lot of confidence building in order to restore the trust that has been breached uh, across the, the Atlantic. We have discussed this uh, at length and in the communication that we adopted today as well, together with Vice President Reading and um, High Representative uh, Cathy Ashton, we set out uh, measures on how this trust can be rebuilt. We talk about the European data protection reform, where I know this committee is very active. We talk about hopes to conclude the umbrella agreement with the United States, hopefully by next spring or summer. There is also, and President Reading will talk about this, uh, a need to review and clarify the rules under the Safe Harbor Agreement. We will um, discuss also possibilities to have international discussions on this uh, framework. And we are looking, we are engaging very much uh, with the American Congress and how they are working in order to see how the reforms that are being discussed in Congress and in Senate could also uh, have positive effects on the European Union in order to, to sort of make a, a better arrangement and better control and limit of what NSA can do um, with better scrutiny and accountability, but also have effects for, for, uh, for us Europeans and other third country nationals. These are ongoing discussions, as you are well aware. Some of you visited the Congress uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the US right now because many US citizens have also been um, disturbed about the, these revelations revelations and we follow them uh, very closely. So this, Madam Chair, gives in a nutshell what I wanted to say. I'm sure there are lots of questions, so I'm, I'm happy to, to try to answer um, them as, as uh, thoroughly as I can, being of course aware that you possibly have not read all the documents as you got them, but I wanted to be here as quickly as possible to, to, to be able to, to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it, is, uh, it is so that we have... 
Πράγματι, πολύ ζητάν το λόγο. Θα ήθελα να πω πως η κυρία Reading θα έρθει στην συνεδρίαση της 1ης Δεκεμβρίου για την έκθεση της Διεθλαντικής Ομάδας Ειδικών και του Ασφαλούς Λιμένα στο Στρασβούργο και να πω πως χάρηκα πάρα πολύ που αναφέρατε την ανάγκη αποκατάστασης της εμπιστοσύνη μεταξύ ΙΠΑ και Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Καλό ήταν που ήρθατε να μας τα πείτε. Από την άλλη ξέρουμε πως υπάρχει μια σοβαρή κατάσταση λόγω της έλλειψης εμπιστοσύνη. Μετά από τα τελευταία συμβάντα. Οπότε, ας ξεκινήσουμε με τα σχόλια των βουλευτών. Μπορούμε να ξεκινήσουμε με τον κύριο Μωραές. Ο κύριο Μπόσου, με συγχωρείτε. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by thanking you for the report. Ευχαριστώ σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για αυτά τα οποία μας είπατε, τα οποία κάπως μας καθησυχάζουν και σας ευχαριστώ για το ότι ασχολείστε τόσο εντατικά με την έρευνα του θέματος αυτού. And looking into what has happened. Μιλήσατε για χώρο. You talked about there being room for improvement. There's no translation. Just... I'm sorry, there seems to be a, a technical problem, but I think it might be sorted out now. Is it okay now? Can you hear the English interpretation now? Shortly again. <laughs> The interpreters apologize. Once again, thank you very much uh, for uh, presenting uh, an account of the circumstances and uh, the um, inquiries. And you've said that there's still room for improvement. I would be interested in, in the quality of these improvements, knowing more about this. Uh, would there be any uh, departure from the level, uh, from the standards we agreed on in the original treaty? Um, uh, are we going to remain at that sort of level and then try and improve on that? Or are we saying there's a huge data protection gap that we need to fill? So when you talk about room for improvement, is it a massive room for improvement that is needed? Or is it just a question of tweaking a bit, uh, just uh, having clearer delineations? And, or are we talking about extreme shortcomings that need to be corrected? I'd be interested to know that. Well, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I think we can go on. We can go like some, some uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Moraes, please. Take the floor. Okay. Thank you, Kinga. Um, again, yes, I would also agree that we need to look at the quality of the improvements, and thank you, Commissioner, uh, for being here. It is difficult um, that we've not had a chance to see the, uh, um, the communication in, in depth um, to give our reaction, but I think you've made an effort to uh, communicate with us, and you've done everything on time in terms of um, communications with um, uh, Co Secretary Cohen and so on, so that there are no complaints there. It's also extremely positive that in the future the consultation process uh, I think will uh, lead to increased transparency around the A12 monitoring system and, and all of that I think is good. So I think from what we've seen of the communication I think the future looks better and it's again I think I agree with uh, Mr. Voss, it's a question of understanding the quality of those improvements and, and time will tell and we need to assess that. So I think um, that is fine. I think we, we need to do our job and assess all of that. I think one of the things we need to assess for the moment um, and get to the heart of before we move ahead though is um, the issue of, of where we close this chapter. And you talked about the, um, uh, you know, closing the chapter on the fact that the US now, saying that we, you know, we didn't breach 
uh, or they didn't breach or access the data. And I think in order to finally close that chapter, I think we need to probably uh, go back to a resolution in October um, and really um, just remind everyone again that when we called for the temporary suspension of the TFTP agreement, um, you know, there were three listed uh, conditions that had been fulfilled. Um, the main points had been the allegations of unlawful access to SWIFT data by the NSA. Um, then in, our, in your letter of the 26th of November to Secretary Cohen, you had said that the consultations with him, combined with the information you received from the designated provider and other sources, had led you to conclude that there were no elements showing that the US government had acted in a manner contrary to the SWIFT agreement, and that the US government had not breached the agreement and would continue to respect it. Now, um, as we understood, the consultation centred solely on the issue of whether the SWIFT system had been hacked or whether the NSA or other US governmental agencies um, had direct access to SWIFT data. Now, the concerns we raised with the Commission, Council and US in our resolution back in October, you'll remember, were that the financial messaging data had been accessed through means other than SWIFT, the SWIFT agreement. And um, here I want to stress that um, members didn't mean the other lawful way of accessing such data, namely the MLAs. So really we still need an answer to this question. Um, and you know, I have to say that we, we understand that you, you may still have not substantially looked into those allegations. So I think before we close the chapter, we really need to have an answer to those allegations. Um, the, the issue still remains quite big, and I, and I don't think as a parliament we have done our job until we receive a substantial answer to that question. So I agree with Mr. Voss, it's a question now of analysing the quality of our ongoing relationship, but we can't close the chapter un unless we focus on, on a clear answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Claude. Uh, Sophie Entveld, please take the floor. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm very pleased that the Commissioner came here immediately to present the, uh, the documents and will read them with great interest. Uh, but I very much agree with uh, the two previous speakers, and um, uh, Claude said that the, uh, the chapter isn't or cannot be closed yet. Uh, if we use this parallel of books, I'd like to, I'm, I'm thinking of you know, my childhood books on, uh, on fairy tales. When we're talking about an investigation whereby the commission asks the, the NSA, did you break into our system and take our data illegally? And then the NSA says, of course we didn't. It right, reminds me a bit of the fairy tale of Little Red Riding Hood asking the big bad wolf, did you eat my grandmother? No, of course not. I mean, that, sorry, that's not an investigation. That is not an investigation. SWIFT said, you know, it conducted its own audit. Well, great, but how can we verify that? Why was there not, as we have asked, an on-site, forensic, technical investigation that would remove any doubt? You know, if we suspect the NSA from taking our data illegally, they are about the last people we should ask whether they actually did it. Because of course they're going to say, scouts honor, we didn't do it. That does not qualify as an investigation. And I find the reassurances, you know, I'm very touched by it, but it's not convincing, sorry. Um, so if you're talking about confidence building measures, this doesn't qualify as one for me. Um, then the European Parliament called for the suspension of SWIFT or the SWIFT agreement, or the TFTP agreement, and the reply of the European Commission is, we ignore that call, instead we propose a European TFTP. That's, you know, again, not very good as a confidence-building measure. Incidentally, we asked for a system for the extraction of data. We did not ask for a full-blown EU TFTP system. And if I read your proposal, I'm quite worried if I read the... Um, I'm not sure now where it was, the justification or the description of the, uh, your, your, the reasons why you reject a system for the extraction of data on European soil. First of all, you seem to think that such a system would mean that US experts would be able to extract directly from the database of SWIFT. But no, what we had in mind is that they ask us for specific data and then our experts will extract the data. 
doesn't mean direct access to U.S. experts. And then secondly, what I find interesting is that you say, um, you know, SWIFT could not uh, do that itself because its current database does not permit searches <laughs> based on personal data. But isn't that the whole basis on the, under the agreement? If they are unable to give specific data, then by definition what you're saying is they are only able, technically, to provide data in bulk. And that means that the agreement, by definition, is null and void, because that's all about reducing um, you know, the transfer of data, not about limiting the transfer of bulk data. So there are a lot of question marks here. Now, I'll read the documents very carefully. Um, but quite honestly, I'm not the least bit reassured. And as far as I'm concerned, confidence building measures are very, very urgent, but not just between the EU and the US, but also between the Parliament and the Commission, between Parliament and the Council, and between citizens and their governments. Uh, and, and, and that includes executives like uh, the European Commission. So uh, I, I hope that I can find, you know, that I will be reassured after having read the documents, but so far, as Claude says, this chapter cannot be closed as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Sophie. Then Mr. Kirchhoff. Well, Chairman, I, uh, I couldn't agree more, I couldn't agree less, I should say, with the last speaker. Um, I, I'd be worried if you did agree. <laughs> well, I first, first of all, I just want to make it clear that um, I at least appreciate the work of the Commission. After all, it is the Commission's responsibility, and uh, it's, I would argue, not the European Parliament's responsibility here, and the Commission has carried out its responsibilities effectively, fast, and uh, I congratulate in particular the Commissioner Malmström for her work on this. And I think uh, I welcome very much the uh, Commission undertaking a review of the current agreements, which, uh, of course, I would have thought, uh, apart from those who distrust absolutely everything, um, would be more than enough to satisfy any reasonable people. I think, of course, it's important that trust is rebuilt. There have been issues here. Um, and uh, I welcome the dialogue that's currently taking place. Uh, I would emphasize once more, and, of course, my colleagues here no doubt will expect me to say this, the United States is one of our most important allies in fighting organized crime and terrorism. We've had a lot of recent experience of all this, and we must find a way to work together in the future. And we must be careful in making all our political points that we don't jeopardize the safety of European citizens. That, of course, in my mind, is absolutely critical. And I think we need to try and separate the issues of intelligence gathering and the agencies attached to that and the day-to-day -day police operations and cooperation, which I think has reached a very high level and very positive level as well. We welcome the possibility of introducing a European terrorist financial tracking program. I think that would provide another layer of security and it would also, of course, be subject to European law. And if you would not mind me simply putting in my own little plug, as I have sat here for some considerable numbers of months, it seems, oh, actually it's years now, trying to move forward uh, a European Union a PNR system which actually, if you were being logical about it, uh, those who have been particularly tested over the United States relationship should surely be extremely keen to see uh, a PNR system properly regulated across the whole of Europe. Um, that would surely um, be something. So there's a certain amount of uh, contradictions here which I find uh, rather tricky to deal with. Um, I just want to finish by saying that, um, you know, well, these agreements are all important to the safety and security of the people of Europe. I'm reassured, by the way, that Europol is confident that the effective implementation of the agreement, agreements do boost security, because passenger data and information from the finance tracking pro program has proved crucial in the security response to a number of terror offences, as we know, including our own 7-7 bombings in England and the Breivik case in Oslo. Um, so what I would say, the Parliament talks about creating lots of safeguards, but it's unwilling really to do anything, I think, to provide a new clear legal framework for citizens across the European Union. I would hope to make progress myself on matters which I have some competence in, but in the meantime, I do think that we should uh, congratulate again the Commission. It is, as I said at the very outset of these remarks, it is the responsibility of the Commission primarily and it is the Commission that seems to me to have exercised its responsibility well 
and I think for that they should be commended. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I would like to ask everyone to be as concise as possible to give the chance uh, to everyone who uh, asked for the floor. So, Mr. Uh, Albrecht, you have the floor. What's next? Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Ms. Malmström, uh, for the presentation. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, I see quite a lot of points in the whole package of communication which are uh, very helpful for our ongoing negotiations and our ongoing work on uh, the whole issue of data uh, transfer data flow and data protection rules and uh, I think that we need to focus on those points uh, mentioning and the, uh, uh, the, huge, the huge amount of data exchange transatlantically for example in the course of the safe harbor agreement uh, and of course in the course of the other law enforcement agreements which we have and where there would be a necessity to have an umbrella agreement for data protection as we have demanded as European Parliament and at every moment when we were negotiating those data exchange agreements, we need an umbrella agreement and there I listened carefully, you mentioned spring or summer, I really urge us to get an agreement which we can approve in this Parliament, that would be key and which of course has to involve uh, the a change of the legal base in the US to cover the fundamental rights of European citizens which at the moment are not mentioned when it comes to legal redress. That was one of the most important points we always discussed in our data exchange and we need to really insist on it. But to insist on it, I think uh, it was a very wise decision of this parliament to uh, say clearly that if there's no movement and there is no movement and if in the exact other direction there's circumvention of, our, of, the, uh, of the safeguards we have, then we also have to draw the consequences. And the consequence which we draw as a majority here in the Parliament, so the European Parliament did, I need some minutes, sorry. Uh, the European Parliament did was to ask for the suspension of the TFTP agreement. And I don't want to get back into the debate, but we asked for it and you just ignored it. That's a severe institutional problem. That's a severe institutional problem because if the European Parliament puts demands and the European Commission just ignores it, we cannot accept that. We cannot accept that and we mentioned in the resolution voted by majority that this has a severe effect on the possibility for the Parliament to adopt future international agreements. Because we, we, can, we cannot really influence the way how these agreements are implemented. We cannot really uh, uh, draw a line where these agreements cannot exist anymore if the Commission just ignores our requests. Uh, then with the TFTS uh, system, I acknowledge that there is uh, the, the mentioning now that the TFTS system perhaps is not what is proportionate. But as Sophie Infeld said, we asked for an extraction method to have individualized data extracted, to have law enforcement access to personal data on a suspicion, on a concrete risk, which is the nature of our rule of law based system and which doesn't work obviously in this moment because we have not uh, the possibility of accessing these bulk data in a way that it's focused on suspicion and on concrete risks. And then uh, let me say one last thing. Um, today I read in the Huffington Post, the National Security Agency has been gathering records of online sexual activity and evidence of visits to pornographic websites as part of a proposed plan to harm the reputations of those whom the agency believes are radicalizing others through incendiary speeches. I mean, we are at a moment where the mass surveillance, where mass surveillance is going in a direction which is completely unacceptable, which is completely undermining our democracy and rule of law. And I don't hear language in your communications going in this uh, direction. I think it's clear that mass surveillance in that scale has failed and we need to withdraw from that. And I also would have liked to hear that 
uh, unlawful from EU law, seen from EU law or member states law, unlawful access to personal data needs to be investigated. So why isn't there investigation, or that could be also a question, is there investigation on the cyber attacks on EU institutions, on the cyber attacks in member states, on servers by foreign uh, or even by uh, EU member state-based authorities or companies. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just would like to confront you with the reality that we have seven more requests for the floor. Uh, now, in one hand, we are closing the list. In other hand, if everyone speaks for five minutes, then we cannot finish on time. So I definitely would like to ask you, I don't want to uh, be uh, very uh, pushy, but I definitely would like to ask you to be concise and to uh, give the floor to everyone, to give the chance to everyone to speak. Next, uh, Cornelia Ernst, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Let me make a preliminary comment, Mrs. Malmström. This a set of documents remind me rather of the documents that we used to get at the end of the German Democratic Republic, unbreakable friendship with the Soviet Union, that kind of thing. It got the more and more unbreakable uh, as the end approached and, it, and that sounded more and more funny. I have this kind of uh, inward uh, aversion against this kind of uh, un... Uh, unshakable friendship being expressed in documents. You may think that this is a rather cynical reaction, but honestly, what is in this document is really not sufficient. <coughs> Just a couple of points. All kinds of splendid consequences you announce. In the annex, please. There are events, there are facts there that are, have nothing to do with terrorism. I mean, just look at what, uh, all kinds of stuff that has happened in the past year that has defended us against terrorism. I mean, it's all plucked out and listed here. But that's no kind of proof that SWIFT had anything to do with this. SWIFT would have had an effect if these data actually involved an offence being prevented. If you could prove that then it would be necessary to have some kind of agreement of this kind. But there is nothing in here. You haven't got a technical explanation of how it happens, nor have you got specific uh, factual proof. The numbers, we know all about them. Other people have already brought those numbers to us. There's no process here. The second attempt at suspension. You have written assurances. We're back to un unshakable friendship again. Uh, that no illegal data were were viewed. But where's the proof? Where's the proof that that is actually so? All you've got is assurances. Uh, I mean, honestly, what proof have you got? Uh, where's the data? Where are, this, are the documents that show that it is really like this? And then has anybody checked, or is anybody still checking, how it came to pass that the NSA got into SWIFT? Has anybody investigated this? Has anybody actually investigated really that accusation? Anybody in the US? Anybody in the EU? Anybody anywhere? What actual results have there been for me? It's not written into uh, solemn assurances, but actual results. And before you draw up some new EU SWIFT agreement or a SWIFT light or SWIFT with friendly support from the NSA, I don't care. Before you do anything like this, these questions at least need to be answered. Uh, before you say, oh, it's all, all right about SWIFT, we can carry on as before. And we can f forget about trying to suspend it. There is 0.0, .0 on the table so far about this. And then, uh, have they stuck to the treaties? Yes. Well, what have we got for proof here? I'm getting fed up with things, with assurances that don't come with any proof attached. 
what we've got here is ignorance of the real situation which makes us as a European Parliament and you as a Commission and indeed as the Council look like fools in the eyes of the citizens who are supposed to be voting first next year. Who are they supposed to vote for now? Yeah? Basic rights have not been defended here and everything should have been done to defend them. Don't you really believe, uh, do you really believe that anybody's going to accept this as anything other than a waste of money? We think this is unacceptable and must be rejected. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, Birgit Sippel, please be short as possible. I will try to do my best. But I must, ganz ehrlich. But I have to say quite honestly that after this presentation, and it's true, I didn't have time to read everything in detail beforehand, but I feel quite irritated. Confidence in the U.S. has been undermined. Confidence has to be rebuilt. But uh, just, you know, giving them the confidence on the basis of their assurance. So, great. I feel irritated because one of the confidence-building confidence measures you mentioned isn't really within your portfolio, that is data protection. And I'd like to point out that the European Data Protection Package and the Umbrella Agreement with the U.S. have got nothing to do with the incidents that have undermined our confidence. Uh, we've been discussing these for more than two years now. Data protection is necessary. There's no doubt about that. But that has got nothing to do with uh, the NSA infringements and violations. So you can't talk about this as being a confidence-building measure after that. Uh, we need to have clearly new uh, procedures uh, regarding data protection and uh, regarding these incidents. Uh, and of course, it's not just the US uh, Secret Services, but uh, others. And now on SWIFT, one of the points that you mention to argue against having data extraction on European territory is the question of cost. You're saying it's too expensive. Well, I mean, I, I find this astounding. Uh, after all we've said about counterterrorism, the need for counterterrorism, uh, there's all the money made available for it uh, in the EU budget. I think uh, 50 million euros to introduce uh, European PNR. That's what it is. And the Commission w wants to get a, a fantastic new border control uh, system. Well, that doesn't come cheap either. It all costs money, uh, despite the economic crisis. So. That's all right by you, but when it comes to extraction of SWIFT data, then suddenly the, the price tag is too high. And if I th understood you correctly, you said that we wouldn't be able to uh, guarantee the data protection standards that we would want. Oh, well. Oh, well. What's the point of data protection if we can't meet our own standards? Then what are we uh, negotiating with the U.S. about then? And uh, a third point that you mentioned was that we wouldn't get any added value, we wouldn't get any extra benefit from this. But surely the aim of the extraction is not to have to deal with all of this bulk data, have all this bulk data being sent off to the US. So the point is to filter out ourselves and only give to a third country specifically selected data that is the subject of a specific request. And I think that is added value, the sort of added value that we should be concerned about. So I feel highly irritated, and I don't think that uh, uh, reading all these documents in more detail will do anything to alleviate that. And my criticism of the EU-US uh, uh, PNR will, uh, my, my, my um, understanding of the EU-US PNR won't be changed by my reading of this. Lord, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I must admit I'm a bit surprised that Commissioner Malmstrom, who, who, whose presence here I, of course, welcome, um, was able to write to the U.S. Treasury closing the consultations under Article 19 um, without first coming to discuss that with us in this committee, considering that we had, by a majority, voted to call for the suspension of the agreement. And it perhaps would have been even tactically wiser to come back to us to explain why there is no need to do that uh, before actually writing to the Treasury, which was only yesterday. 
Um, it smacks of preemption somewhat, I'm afraid, and I, I'm normally not at all critical of the Commissioner, but I am a bit puzzled by that, why you couldn't wait till late this afternoon to write, to write that letter. My puzzlement, and, and really I'm asking the same as I asked two months ago, I've never understood the letter from David Cohen of the 18th of September, um, but insofar as I do, it appears to be clearly saying that TFTP is not the sole access to SWIFT data. So, you know, in one sense one can understand that because they said that it's natural that subpoenas served upon financial institutions and investigations targeting criminals yield some SWIFT messages along with other financial records. One can sort of understand that, but it, I haven't had the chance to read all the report is that covered then in the report that there are other channels to get SWIFT data? Okay, well I do need to read it because they then went on to say, Mr. Cohn went on to say the US government is using the TFTP to, to, to obtain SWIFT data that we knew not obtain from other sources. Now I confess and I think I said this two months ago, naively I did not know that it was meant to be, if you like, the, the last resort when they'd exhausted all other possibilities for getting SWIFT data, I thought it was the first resort, if not the only resort. So I am puzzled about that. But as I say, I hope to discover from your, uh, from your report precisely what the answer is then to that question. Uh, is there one or several channels? I also didn't really quite follow in the PNR report on page three. You, you talk about an assessment of the question whether PNR says the purpose of supporting the fight against terrorism, but actually don't answer the question. You just say that um, it allows uh, DHS to do pre-departure assessments up to 96 hours. It doesn't, you know, we keep asking, where's the beef? What, what's the proof of stopping uh, terrorists? And we never quite seem to pin that down. And I don't know if this report does either. Uh, Madame Verjat, please, and please, shortly. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, I would also like to thank the Commissioner for uh, coming here to see us so soon after the report was adopted by the Commission. But just like the other colleagues, I haven't had a time to really read the uh, documents uh, thoroughly yet. I've, of course, seen the reactions in the press and uh, the initial information I've uh, received and reactions, well, is in line with what we've already heard from our colleagues. But I, I also agree with what's been said about how you present things to us. First of all, you talked about the efficiency of the fight against uh, uh, terrorism and then, then about the cost of uh, protecting uh, citizens. I don't think that's the right way of presenting things. And I also agree with what Cornelia Ernst said. Uh, well, we haven't seen any proof of the efficiency of these counter-terrorist measures in, in these examples. I mean, we just have a list and it says that these are examples, but we don't know exactly how. And we need to know how the procedures uh, are being useful in order to strike the right balance between the protection of the citizens and uh, what uh, sort of measures are adopted to counteract terrorism. Now, um, what you've also mentioned in your presentation is that the in usefulness of uh, these agreements and how significant they are, but uh, uh, the principles under uh, uh, like this isn't, aren't really about just about how um, they are useful perhaps in general, but more about how they are useful in terms of achieving the targets and uh, the, the goals we've set without infringing the fundamental rights for citizens. Now, I've also several times heard uh, remarks from uh, Europol and, uh, and other agencies that haven't perhaps uh, taken into account. And yes, I will come to a close very soon, don't worry, Chair. But uh, these uh, concerns raised by different agencies are just uh, submitted and nothing seems to be done about them. And then finally, you also mentioned here that we don't have any proof 
uh, that there has been any unlawful access. However, there uh, has been a lot of information in the media, and so we see that there at least is a quite a, a general suspicion about something having occurred, there having been incidents. So exactly what are you basing your affirmations on that, that this is not the case? And I also agree with what uh, Mr. Albrecht said, and it's a fundamental issue, and that is that we need to protect citizens in Europe. And, and again, you know, we're, we haven't gotten very far on that. Thank you. It's all formulated, but if you'd like to hear the, the answers also, then we have to speed up a little bit our process. So, uh, Madame Romero Lopez, as the next, please try to give your time. Thank you, Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll do what I can. Uh, Commissioner Barnstam. When we got the package, of course, we weren't able to read it because it was only a little time ago, and we're deeply grateful to you for it. But one first question comes into one's mind. It looks as if the people who did this have simply not taken into account all the things that have happened. This total uh, cataclysm arising out of Mr. Snowden's revelations, because the fact is that trust has been lost and you too don't seem to be aware that we actually called for the suspension of the TFTP. And just yesterday we had American members of Congress here and we managed to persuade them uh, now to question even the Patriot Act and everything that in the future their spy services will be doing. So we are at a moment when trust has been totally lost. There were even some members of the EPP yesterday saying that the PNR agreement ought to be suspended. It's really not the time to revise all this or to look at this package because trust has been broken. What we need to be thinking about is how to restore the situation, how to get a different situation. Because what has happened was all before the Snowden, and now after Snowden, everything is different. It's not that they've revealed things that we all knew. It's that the Americans have realized, apparently, that they can't pursue terrorism at the expense of fundamental liberties. And it's terrorism is not Mrs. Merkel's telephone, and neither does it have anything to do with Petrobras. The whole mechanism is broken and we need, if we want trust, to start talking again. We'll have to talk about the legal framework for, G for, for assistance and we might end up with a different reform, but to bring this package to us under these circumstances is as if it comes out of the 20th century. It's got nothing to do with the situation now. Uh, Mr. Weidenholzer. Uh, thank you, Shun. Thank you very much. I, too, am very happy that you've come uh, so quickly, uh, Commissioner, to meet us. But I think that's the only uh, positive thing I can say, because I get the impression that this is a procedure where we're just rushing ahead in great haste to do any old thing, really. I think uh, the work is far from finished on this. And... It's not appropriate to, to say that uh, the matter is closed without discussing this with us. It's not acceptable that we should only just get the documents now. Uh, some people got them in the morning, and other, other people got them just an hour ago. Mine was still hot off the press when I got them pressed into my hand. Um, so I think it's going to be absolutely vital uh, for you to come and speak to us again when we've had an opportunity to study these documents and I endorse everything that the colleagues have said it, it's not sufficient just to ask someone whether they have done what they should have done uh, you do need to have scientific uh, research you need to have uh, correct uh, methods uh, to investigate so this case is not closed the chapter is not closed and we in this House will state this very, very clearly because it is a breach of trust. And you rightly talked about confidence building, about the need for us to have confidence in our American friends. Well, I agree, but uh, what, you are leering, what you are losing here is, is the confidence of European citizens. You are um, putting that in jeopardy with this way of going about things. And... Um, I'd like to ask whether you
can rule out that um, commercial espionage is being uh, carried out uh, as a result of this exchange of data. And also, I'd like to have an idea of the quantitative dimension. We haven't really talked about that yet. How many terrorists, how many sets of terrorist data have been intercepted in this way? Uh, finally, um, I'm pleased that we've had an opportunity to hear the views of our American colleagues in the Congress. Um, but you mustn't overlook the fact that, that there are also parliaments in Europe, which are just as important. And uh, it's important as well that uh, you consult them. Thank you very much. Uh, as far as I see, uh, Madam Corazza Beard would like to speak very shortly. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. I had not asked the floor because I don't comment usually very important and technical issues when we have not read the reports, but I, I admire that my colleagues on the other side of the House have such a in-depth knowledge with, before reading the documents, but it says a lot of what concerns me. As we all try together to join forces to restore confidence in Europe with the United States, I, do not, I wonder if this is the right attitude. We heard outrage, unacceptable, zero point, everything is the, is the fault of the Commission. Are we going to declare war to the United States? What are you suggesting? Are we going to be the Netanyahu of Europe? that even when the United States and Iran make an amazing agreement, which of course is one step forward, two steps backwards. That's how you restore confidence in a civilized world where we, where we use dialogue, Sophie. We talk to the United States. You know why? Because we are not the tribunal of the world. We are partners. We are allies with the United States. And you know what? This is not only no, about them. I have, the floor. Each other. I have the floor, my Sophie, dear. Please, Vita. Because this is not about the entire program of mass surveillance that shocks and concerns all of us. We're talking about two specific agreements. Guys, agreement. The word agreement means two partners. Definitely, we talk to them. And I don't think that what, what has been said or what is in the letter here is about closing the dossier. Because when I read the letter, everywhere I see, we have agreed to intensify efforts. We have agreed to intensify scrutiny. We have agreed to work together more. And I'm not saying that this is solved or that I am satisfied. I'm just saying we're not a tribunal. We want to restore confidence with the people of Europe. We want to ensure the maximum level of, of protection of our data. We, we have similar goals on that. I'm not sure that this way of just bashing and smashing everybody and their dog is the right way forward. And that concerns me very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Commissioner, as you see, it's a very emotional uh, issue. And uh, it was also, we could uh, also expect uh, this type of comments. And as uh, we mentioned at the beginning, uh, there is a serious uh, concern uh, with this uh, NSA and the lack of trust uh, toward the U.S. The real question is really how to restore this and what can we do together, listening to each other's opinion. And I think in that sense it was important to, to listen to these opinions. So uh, please take the floor and try to answer uh, or comment on, uh, on all of this. Comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, of course, I will try to answer as much as possible, and I fully recognize that you haven't read the report. I'm, I'm sorry about this, but, but the, you have to weigh this for, for the possibility to come as, as quick as possible. But I'm, I'm willing, as always, to come back and, and to answer more questions later when you have, have read them. Uh, the, the, we, we always try to, to, to come from the Commission when, when any committee uh, wants us. Now, uh, of course, Everything that has happened around the revelation of what NSA has been doing is something that has created outcry all over the world. I am upset, you are upset, citizens all over the world, including in the US, are upset that this NSA has grown into something uncontrollable that has been, been, been exercising uh, mass surveillance in, in a way that is probably illegal in many ways and that is very, very uncomfortable. This is not acceptable, and there are lots of different processes ongoing in order to see can we bring clarity to this and how can we move forward. Now, what I was tasked to do was to look at one specific agreement, uh, the TFTP. In addition, we had long going before Snowden uh, processes that I had promised to, to you to do, to do a, a report on the added value of TFTP, to do a first report on PNR. It is just a review on how they... they 
fulfill the agreement, we have also examples on what they do in the PNR, and we can share that with uh, members of the committee in, in a smaller format. So we have examples to do that. And in addition, to, to look at different options of extracting data on European souls. Now, I thought it was made sense to come with all of this today, but this is just one part of the NSA. The Commission is not ignoring the calls from, from, from the European Parliament, but you called for a suspension. If you read the agreement on TFTP, it says that if there are any disagreement on the interpretation or the fulfilment of this agreement, we should uh, convey formal consultation. And after those consultations, if it is not still an agreement, the, the agreement can be suspended. You cannot just suspend it. It's against the agreement. What I did was to immediately launch formal consultations. And I have not just called them and say, did you break the agreement? No, okay, fine, do. Let's go and have a coffee. We have uh, dedicated hours and hours and hours to try to find answers to all the questions that we have read about in the paper. But the Commission is not a police. We cannot investigate. We cannot do scientific, um, specific investigation. We can only ask questions. We can have dialogue because this is what we do with our partners. And we have done this uh, a lot. We have received uh, a lot of answers. We have received um, clarifications. And we have received written assurances by the White House and by Treasury that they haven't broken the agreement. This is as far as we can get from the Commission side. We cannot get any further on this. We have no proofs that they have broken the agreement. We cannot prove it in any way except for some, there, there are, are, are newspaper allegations, but these are, are clearly not enough in order to really prove that there has been, been allegations, uh, there has been, 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 been breach. But this is not enough. Of course, we are building, as you can see in the letter from, from David Cohen, building up more uh, trust building without renegotiating the, uh, negotiating the agreement, but by bringing the overseers, the, over, the formal overseer and the deputy overseers, more into the data protection authorities there, involving them in more transparency in the threat assessments and so on, so they will have a, a fuller picture. And they then do the, the, the overseer, and they, we will keep on uh, watching this agreement very, very closely, and we will do a new review uh, next spring, so we will have everything we, we can to, to, come, to come back, every reason to come back. Uh, for this. Uh, the, it is the Commission who formally uh, consults. Uh, the whole College take that decision. The whole College has this morning decided to close uh, the, the consultation in this particular uh, aspect. Um, now, um, on uh, on, on the, the quality of the confidence building, well, we have proposed a few elements in the, in the uh, TFTP, a few elements where we think there is in further uh, improvement to be made in the PNR when it comes to the uh, quicker depersonalization of data, more transparency, more information, data statistics, and so on, uh, jointly to push uh, towards a push, a full push uh, system, uh, etc., etc. Uh, and, and this, of course, will, will be checked with you and, and regularly reported as well. On the overall, uh, we need to do a lot more. I mean, things are not solved. Things are not fine and dandy. We are still very concerned about what NSA has been doing uh, on, on the European individuals, possibly companies uh, as well. And that's why we are engaged in the data protection that you are here working on, but also in this umbrella agreement that I think would bring better clarity and protection uh, for the citizens. And, and uh, you can ask Vice President Reading when she comes for more details because she's the one conducting the nego negotiations. But I was with her in the U.S. last week, and uh, she and uh, the Attorney General, who is also very concerned about this, uh, have agreed to do everything in their power to agree before the summer uh, on this. And you've also heard that President Obama has, has, uh, has expressed that, that just because you can, it doesn't mean that you have to. And there are a lot of discussions and talks and reform proposals in the uh, two chambers of the Congress. And I follow them with great interest. And we, we don't only hope, but we expect that the, 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 the limitations, the stricter regulations, the better oversee and accountability of what NSA can do and cannot do will also have effects on uh, our protection and our possibilities uh, to, to, as, as Europeans or as non-European citizens to have greater protection there. On, um, on the extraction, uh, yeah, but you still, SWIFT is, is bulk data. 
You don't call SWIFT and ask, can I have Sophie Intenveld's data? You get bulk data for a certain period of time. And from that, based on individual uh, investigations, you can get uh, extract individual data. So you would still have to build up a system of extraction uh, in Europe on European soil. Can that be done? Yes, of course it can be done. Of course, yes. And we, 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 we show that this can be done. But the question is whether it is desirable, whether it is motivated, whether it is proportionate uh, to do it right now to construct such a database in the European Union. I have my doubts, but I leave it up to you and to the Council. The Council has so far not be, been, been pointing at any uh, direction that they would be willing to do so. And after our first discussion two years ago, there was no rapporteur designated from this, um, this uh, committee, and, and there were no clear views expressed either to guide us on how to move forward. But I leave this in your hands. You can read the different options and the impact assessment that is on the website of the Commission, and you can make your conclusions and, and possibly uh, propose something that the next uh, legislature and Commission will we'll, uh, we'll take uh, forward. There were so many questions. Madam Chair, you have to help me if I, if I <laughs> forgot. Yes, the fundamental concerns uh, were mentioned. And so well, no, I, I realise that, that uh, we, we are, you have not get, got all the answers. Neither have we. We have not got all the answers we have asked to the American in the general NSA debate, and we are keep on pushing. Uh, we would have liked the Council to be a bit more cooperative in, in their talks with, with the US, but from the Commission on these particular files, this is as far as we have gotten for the moment. It doesn't mean that, that we just close and, and, and move on as if nothing has happened, but this is where we are. We will keep on looking, uh, we will keep on watching, we will keep on reviewing and have a very close um, monitoring on this, and I will, of course, keep on reporting to you, and I'm happy to come back at any time, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much. I think it is what